Hello, my name is Anissa. I'm originally from the UK, but I've been in Singapore for about 10 years. So I'm already Singaporean. Okay, not quite officially though. Um, I'm from Raffles College of Higher Education in Singapore, and I teach fashion marketing and management. I'm here today to talk a little bit about creating a business that will be sustainable financially and also ethically. It doesn't matter how ethical you are, if your business doesn't solve a problem for a customer, you're probably not going to be so successful. So most successful businesses, or if not all successful businesses, solve a problem for a distinct group of customers. So it could be that I can't find shoes because I have big feet, I want clothes for work. Every customer is actually hiring a product to do a job. So there's a great framework out there which you can Google called the Customer Proposition Canvas. Essentially, it helps us think about the pain points your customer might go through. So a little bit deeper than the usual, I want to create a fashion brand or I want to be sustainable. Think deeply about the customer's pains and what they're looking to gain. So it's a great tool and I suggest that after this you try to Google it. A good example of a brand that really solves a customer's problem, in my opinion, is Rothy's. Rothy's basically does good by creating sustainable shoes made from plastic. So um, they're helping to reduce plastic, but they realize they're basically solving the problem for a particular group of uh, men and women who want comfortable flat shoes. The other great thing is the shoes are washable and they're um, very lightweight. So you can imagine they've got a lovely uh, target niche that um, they offer uh, their products to, which is people who uh, stand on their feet all day, maybe someone in F&B or even teachers. So Rothy's is a fantastic example of solving um, a customer's problem. So another option, maybe it's not that you're solving a new problem. Maybe you're thinking about a product category that already exists and you are reimagining that category. A great example is Aesop, a natural skincare brand. Aesop creates their own uh, direct uh, distribution in these beautiful stores. So through branding, they've been able to tell really interesting stories and elevate the whole experience of skincare. Anybody who's into sort of minimalism, loves packaging and minimalist design, absolutely falls in love with Aesop. Um, so that's an example of a brand that's reimagined a product category and made it uh, different. Another great example is a menswear brand from America called Bode. Now, I don't wear menswear and I don't particularly, I'm a main customer for this brand, but I absolutely fell in love when I saw their Instagram. Bode sources leftover textiles. So heirloom textiles like uh, curtains or a um, tablecloth, any vintage te textiles that they can get hold of to create a beautiful uh, story for men who want statement pieces with detailing. Another great example who you might be familiar with is Glossier. So Glossier again, thought about skincare, but for a new generation of customers, millennials love Glossier. I would say Glossier really owns that whole millennial pink. They understand that their customers doesn't want the same kind of products as uh, their parents. So instead of a really wide range, they, they limit the range to the key things and make beautiful packaging that fit that kind of whole millennial lifestyle. So that's the first point I wanted to cover is, does it solve a problem? The second point is this group of people that you're solving a problem for, is there enough of them? I could go into more details, but I wanna keep it simple. Essentially, you can look into um, any market, example, Singapore, there's five point something million of us in Singapore. How many people exist in Singapore that could be your potential target market? You have to think of clever ways to guesstimate. And I think they're sharing my details later. So if you have any problems with this, you can always contact me later. Essentially, how much will it cost you to reach those customers? If your product is $10 and you're only making $2 profit, you have to think again, don't you? Because it might cost you more to reach each customer. Even if you use a, a social media, um, Instagram, so on and so forth. There might be a time where you have to actually pay to gain a customer. I know there's clever ways to do marketing for free, but build in the cost of acquisition into um, your product price, and therefore you're gonna likely to be more successful. Another thing about these people that we talked about, the total available market, are they really willing to adopt this new innovation? Do they really um, have the money, uh, the spending power? Uh, you've got to kind of consider something like sustainability. I'm often asked, is sustainability, you know, making traction? Are people really believing it? Because we hear it a lot, don't we? We see it in marketing. Everyone's talking about it. And I always say, how many sustainable brands exist that actually hire space on Orchard Road? 
apart from the lovely Swapaholic. Um, <laughs> there's not many, is there? So when you have one sustainable brand in Singapore that has 24 outlets, like a lot of the fast fashion brands, then you know Singaporeans are adopting sustainable fashion. So if you don't see that, you know that this is a niche market. So when you first start, you know you're going to have to spend a lot of money to get to that niche market. And it might take time before your business can be scalable, for example. So there's a lovely uh, framework called Roger's Theory of Innovation. And that explains how products go from innovators all the way to the early majority. And it's at the early majority adopting your product where you're going to make serious amounts of money uh, to make any distinction in the market. OK, so the third part I want to make about the ethical and sustainable business is the product life cycle. Just going on um, from Roger's Theory of Innovation. Is the market ready for this product? Are there the right payment system? Is there the right distribution? A great example is I had a business in the 90s. I had a friend who was very forward with technology. He started a website for me. And I sat back and said, yep, here we go. We're going to make lots of money. Unfortunately, the website was beautiful. But we weren't there yet in terms of Wi-Fi. You had to wait ages for the pictures to load. And no one bought anything from that website, I'm sad to say. But it was very beautiful. Um, another great example, which is not for fashion, but Wordly. Wordly, if you've heard of it, spread so fast, didn't it? Because we all have smartphones. The technology was there for the guy who started it. I think he created it for his wife to entertain his wife. We were able to share information now on social media. All the right infrastructure was there to make that a success. So think about the product lifecycle as much as the target market and the adoption. And think again, who or which customer are you solving a problem for? So the next thing I want to talk about is corporate social responsibility or CSR. We've kind of all heard about CSR, but just in case for those who may not know, it's accountability to all our stakeholders. It's been going for the last 20, 30 years. As you know, even at my school days, we were thinking about CSR. It's a company's accountability to the employees, shareholders and the public. And we see quite a lot of CSR in Singapore. The typical um, CSR um, initiatives we see from companies are, you know, donation to charity, charity drives, supporting specific communities, adopting communities, maybe the aged or kids, for example, in any one community, looking after the environment. Maybe there's a clothing drive or how they kind of look after the staff in the workplace. So, for example, during COVID, a company might buy, you know, proper desks or help the, um, the uh, employees have a little bit of uh, money towards buying a nice uh, desk or creating a nice desk space at work that's more ergonomic, things like that. But there's new models now as well. So new frameworks. Um, one that's gaining popularity is ESG. So you, maybe you've heard of that. And that kind of simplifies CSR and says, actually, we need to think about key dimensions, one being the environment, the social dimension and governance. So how does the company basically measure its um, its operations and measure not just as profits, but exa exactly how it's doing in, under those dimensions. What is it doing to um, impact the environment? What is it doing to reduce the impact on society? Um, what is it doing in terms of its policies and the way it governs its stakeholders as well and suppliers and so on and so forth? A great example is I was going past um, OCBC and it was raining and I saw this machine which looked like a giant carpet and I said, what, what is that? So I had a look. And they said there was a lovely sign saying we no longer use plastic to help the environment. So you could just put your umbrella through and it would just wipe it off. How clever is that? Something really simple. So companies will use ESG to set targets and goals that they want to meet, um, as well as think about measure their success from the past. Another much more easier one, which I teach my students, is triple bottom line. People, profit, planet. Easy to remember, isn't it? So for fashion brands, when you're creating your... Uh, company policy um, and maybe your supply chain, think about every action that you take. How is it affecting people? Are you paying fair wages? Not just in the supply chain, but right here in Singapore. Um, I'm told there's no minimum wage, and this is very controversial. I'm sorry to bring it up, but I, I kind of have to say it. Um, some brands who I work with want to pay $8, but then they want staff that are really trained to a high level who can use technology and so on and so forth. Now, is that ethical? Is it fair? Um, I leave that to the brand to think about it. Uh, what else uh, do I want to talk about? Basically, the planet. 
So an easy win, for example, is for fashion brands, we use a lot of plastic in the supply chain. So for a fashion brand, or if you're creating your new brand, can you remove plastic out of your supply chain? Do it early before you start. So this is an easy win, uh, low hanging fruit for startups. Can we replace plastic with something, or single use plastic, because not all plastic is, is bad, but can we replace single use plastic with something that's better for the environment? So um, as I said, uh, e-commerce packaging is the perfect place to start. Can you find uh, mailers that are compostable? Can you fill your mailer boxes instead of polystyrene with something else that's more friendly to the environment? Can you have reusable packaging? It's a fantastic example. Um, Chloe I came across the other day, which is a luxury brand, has um, basically got B Core status. B Core status means a third party has come and assess all Chloe's processes, its supply chain, and found it to be a brand that's planning and envisioning a more sustainable future thinking about ethics, thinking about fair wages, to the point they're actually using social enterprises. And they say by a certain period, they want to have all their supply chain to be giving back to society, which I think is amazing. Okay, so the next point I want to make is about striking the balance between ethical and financial viable business decisions. All businesses will face uh, decisions that they have to make. So. You can build ethics into your company, and two great examples are Costco, which is more B2B um, in America, and John Lewis, the John Lewis partnership. Costco basically um, only charges a 15% margin to keep products, which they sell to sort of mom and pop stores at a good price. Um, this was back in the day, I'm not sure now, post COVID. They have a very flat management system, which is amazing. I would love to work in a company with a flat management system. They have employee benefits and healthcare for all staff. The CEO to the warehouse worker gets the same benefits, amazing. As a result, Costco has one of the lowest staff turnovers um, in the US. Another brand close to my heart is John Lewis, which is known as a partnership. But basically the staff own the company. They take a share of the product, pro sorry, profits every single year. Now, that's companies that are building in ethics into their whole business model. Another example of great business decision making is, but, is Eileen Fisher, because this is a brand that's been ethical from way back in the day. And Eileen Fisher is actually showing how they're responding to the changing needs and the changing conversation in fashion and sustainability. So Eileen Fisher has been way ahead. It's a slow fashion brand. They use better fabrics, classic designs, which you can wear season after season. Um, sustainable fibers. She was actually bringing up the whole cotton issue in northern China, um, another controversial issue, way before the rest of the world. You know, she was willing to speak out publicly. Um, Eileen Fisher has realized there's a major waste issue. So, according to the World Bank, basically waste is growing faster than population growth. Um, in East Asia and the Pacific, 23% of the world's waste is actually generated um, in this region. Another alarming stat is that most uh, brands that you see on the high street, so or, all the lovely luxury brands or also fast fashion brands that we know, can uh, produce or overproduce between 20 and 40% in order to meet uncertain demand. That means, um, I used to be a buyer myself, so I know that it's hard to forecast what people will buy so as a result, for every style, many brands, especially fast fashion, are overproducing. So what is happening with this product afterwards? It's going to waste, obviously. So essentially, Eileen Fisher is aware of waste. I don't think they overproduce. That's not what I'm saying. But they're building in a take-back system. They're building in circularity into their design. Um, the founder talked about how uh, basically they realized once they started testing how to be more circular, taking back the products, they realized they had to design differently. They had to put in um, less complicated seaming so that this, this seams could be taken apart easily. They had to think about um, trims. They had to think about zips, buttons, all that kind of thing. How could they reduce all that kind of waste? So they built into the design a product that will be sent back and it would be easy to upcycle. So they have a whole unit that upcycles the product. And if the product is you know, beyond being reused and upcycled, they actually have a lovely um, uh, policy to create felted products. Um, Eileen Fisher, uh, the founder, mentioned that it is a cost of the business that takes up a lot of space. Um, and they're working it out slowly. But at least they're sort of envisioning um, trying to address the waste issue. So that's responding to the problem as things go along. 
The last thing I would like to talk about is um, one that's kind of really topical thanks to COVID. So what happens when you have a really tough decision to make? So if you're a founder, uh, if you're a founder of a business, you haven't yet started, build this in, right, to your vision and mission or your SOPs, your standing operating policy. If you are an existing business, it'd be a great time to sort of think about this and maybe talk about this with your, with your colleagues. So COVID, um, we saw the sort of retail Armageddon that happened during COVID. So a lot of brands let employees go, um, understandably, not just in fashion, in many kind of other sectors. Um, some brands didn't let employees go and they got, what, what can I say, much more uh, heartfelt understanding from the public. Some brands had open communication channels and were really willing to talk through what happens next when orders were canceled, etc. So from what I saw, the brands that did well uh, during COVID, as in terms of the public opinion and brand image, are those that had open communication channels and were working things out with their suppliers, with their staff. So a good example is voluntary redundancy, talking with your staff about uh, pay cutbacks. No one wants to talk about these difficult things, but you've got to think about working on solutions together, not just thinking we're the brand, we make the decisions. But if you say you're ethical, you've got to behave ethically. Um, a good example of this is Everlane, which was a transparent brand. Everybody loved it. It was a poster child of sustainability. But in 2020, they basically wanted to get rid of employees and they banned them from, uh, allegedly anyway, banned them from uh, setting up a union. This got, got them a huge bas backlash and the public really turned against Everlane. So you've got to be really careful that if you put out that you're a sustainable, ethical brand, you've got to think about that with the employees. And you've got to think about what happens when things go wrong in the worst case scenario. And I totally understand maybe why Evelyn did what they did at the time without thinking about the repercussions. They were just thinking, we need to survive this. What do we do? And another brand close to my heart um, after COVID is Shenzhong. It's not fashion, <laughs> but they gave their staff a 16 months bonus both part-time and full-time. I think that's brilliant. because so obviously food was doing really well during COVID and they wanted to share the love. I thought, let's end on Shenzhong. What a fantastic brand. So thank you so much for listening.